this episode Ah, such a good conversation between myself and Rita Bozy. Now, instead of just reading you her whole biography uh, so that you can you know her background, I'll give you a little bit of a taste. And then I just, I encourage you to go investigate some more of her history and her expertise on her website. Super easy to find, but um, I will tell you a little bit about her and then I want to tell you how I got connected with her. So Rita was uh, a ballet dancer for a long time. She is um, in the theater. She's an author. She is a somatic therapist and and psychedelic therapist and also uh, a facilitator for different trainings. Now, the way that Rita and I got connected is that for those of you who are new to the podcast, I will share with you that I have been interested in psychedelic studies for the last couple of years, particularly psychedelics in tandem with other therapeutic tools in order to really drill down to the subconscious mind to have access to being able to change some of those deep rooted traumas and narratives that we have going on that are more difficult to access in some of the more like quote unquote traditional ways. So I, I've been interested in the, the psychedelics in the therapeutic space for a while and I have been periodically reaching out to people who are in the psychedelic space and they come to it f- through a, a many different ways. Um, but I have been just educating myself more on what exactly psychedelic therapy is and how to use it in a really profound and long lasting way. So I've been reaching out to, you know, doctors, I've been attending conferences, reading books, et cetera, et cetera. And I, I reached out to a doctor who works with families who have children, part of the palliative care um, unit at the hospital that that um, this physician works at. And if a family has a child who has a life shortening illness, they are part of palliative care, which means that they have access to different tools and different ways of helping this family cope with a terminal diagnosis for their child and be able to offer all sorts of different levels of care from diagnosis until until they end up needing to go on hospice. So I spoke with this physician, had a really great conversation with this person, and I found out that they do a lot of work with parents who are who are dealing with child loss. So families that have lost children due to illness, but most of the families that this physician works with have lost their children suddenly to tragic circumstances, um, sometimes by you know, death by suicide or by you know some other kind of tragic accidents. And so I was able to not only connect with this physician, but to be able to speak with a parent who has worked with psychedelics as part of their healing protocols dealing with the loss of their child. So through this route, I connected with a mother who connected me with another mother who said, you have to, if you're interested in psychedelic studies, you have to get connected with Rita. So I sent Rita an email I got on her schedule to be able to have a conversation with her and just ask her questions about how she uses psychedelics in healing in in a therapeutic practice and the conversation that we had didn't we didn't really discuss psychedelics that much which was really great because she talked about how psychedelics are just a small piece of the puzzle that psychedelics don't work for everybody but they're part of this bigger picture of how do we get our bodies online because our nervous systems are not just located in our brains it's not just about the cognitive thinking it's about how do these memories and these traumas and these messages get stored in our bodies so psychedelics might be one tool that work for some people are not recommended or don't work for other people, but it's just, it's part of this bigger picture of how we address ourselves from the top down, from the inside out to facilitate healing. So I love this conversation very, very much with Rita. This is not the original conversation that we had. We, you know, obviously booked a time to talk on this podcast, but so many, so many good takeaways for me from this conversation about what do you do when you are feeling stressed out, maxed out? How do you 
do good in the world when you feel like I can't even do good inside here. I can't, how do I heal what's going on in here? How, why would I even think that I could attempt to heal what's going on out here in my larger environment, whether it's my community or my country or the world? So we had a great conversation about all of those things, what it means to be somatically in tuned and to heal our nervous systems and to be able to process trauma in a long lasting way. So all that to say, thanks for joining me for this episode. I think you're really going to enjoy this conversation with Rita Bozzi. I am so excited to have this conversation with you, Rita. Thank you for taking time out of your extremely busy schedule to talk with me and my audience today. Well, you're, you're such a delight. How could I say no? <laughs> oh, thank you. Well, um, I, in our little pre-recording, pre-record session, we started to talk about this really big topic of understanding what it is to be human. And I would love for us to just start there. And then we can kind of drill down into whatever little avenue that takes us to for what that means to be human and how to become more human. And mm -hmm. like you said, more of a humane human. So what, what exactly does this mean to you? What does, what have you come to understand about what it means to be human? Well, Okay, I'm going to just take a breath and go internal for a minute because it's such a complex question. And I do want to say before I answer it directly or indirectly is that <clears throat> this line of questioning likely has come to me by the mere fact that I'm, if for those people that are into astrology, I'm a Sagittarian and it's the the uh, the humanist, right? It is the, uh, the sign that is concerned with what is it to be human and uh, also my extraordinary teacher, uh, Sharon Stanley, has also been asking this question, as has Antonio Damasio, you know, like what makes us human? What is it that links us across the species as a species? Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, Antonio Damasio talks about the, the, that, the, the cells that we, it, we are all um, we are all trying to get to homeostasis and that homeostasis comes up from the cell up through the body, up to the brain, to the mind, to the spirit. And we can feel when we're out of homeostasis and we can feel when the earth has fallen out of its homeostasis. And so there's that beautiful science side of how do we come back to homeostasis? And in that homeostasis, we are more empathic and we are more caring. We are more kind. That's integration. And then for me, the, like the question of humane humanity, it's really how do we as human beings come to recognize that we have all undergone something? Like that to me is a huge question of how do I approach my work and how do I approach people is not to forget this question of what happened for you? What happened to you? And that to me is a humane humanity, that question, you know, Sharon's asked that question in our work together. Um, and so I really took it to heart and I really stopped myself and said, how, e even in the moments where I'm like, you know, I feel irritated by a certain person or not connecting with a certain person, but if I could just for a moment reset myself and go, whatever they're doing here, whatever behavior they're doing or what, whatever way they're organizing their physiology or whatever way they're organizing themselves or this conversation right now, I have to stop for a split second and go, this is what happened to you. Mm -hmm. However you're organizing right now, however you're speaking or thinking, this is what happened to you. And, and, you know, I, th I, I think we're a long way from a humane humanity, but we're on the path we're, we're, we're getting there. We're starting to really reflect on what colonialism has done to everybody, what patriarchy has done to everybody and how that does live in our cells, how it does live in our neurobiology, how, no matter how, you know, thoughtful our communities have been, it, gets entrained in the brain and it gets entrained in the body. So it's so subtle and <clears throat> being human is not just waking up and being born. It is a life work. It is such a life work to be a humane human, 
to ourselves and to each other. Like even the question, even when people come in and say, oh, I don't feel worthy. That's not even the work to me. That, that, that is like the silks. That's the smoke screen. Even the word I'm not worthy is the smoke screen because there's so much energy under that. There's so much shame under that. There's so much freeze and shut down under that. So much disconnect under that. So many painful systems that have been created to separate humans, to, to devalue humans, to devalue earth, to devalue the living, uh, 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 you know, the plants and animals and everything that's living. There's been so much that's devalued us. And of course we don't feel valuable because we've been so devalued mm. in the name of systems and greed and capitalism and all the things that have kept us so bound up. So I think I've just, <laughs> I'm a bit of an octopus. All of a sudden my, my <laughs> tentacles go out and I go all these things. And so mm. whatever you want to chew down on there or <laughs> grab onto, I'm happy. Whatever direction you want to take that in. Yeah. What, what came, came up for me just in that last part about what you said about the the worthiness, because I, I do hear that from a lot of people, this sense, this deep sense of unworthiness. Mm -hmm. And there's, there really is um, difficulty with some of the Western based, very intellectual kind of neck up ways of therapy, you know, cognitive behavioral therapy, talk therapy, DBT, mm -hmm. all of these are fantastic tools, but they don't do a ton on their own. Because like you said, there's, there's a lot of underneath churning and programming that that contributes to why we think the way that we do so if we have these thoughts coming up of i'm unworthy and if we only ever focus cognitively on how to change the wording and how to not think that about ourselves anymore we're missing all of the stories that have built that structure and that we can't separate our internal experience from the influence of the culture from the influence of the time that we're in. And so it does, sometimes I feel a little bit overwhelmed by all of it because I think like, where do I start exactly when I'm trying to bring homeostasis to myself on a deeper level? Mm -hmm. And I love this conversation around homeostasis too, because it does feel like if we're not in a state of homeostasis, it almost becomes impossible for us, for us to ask the question about other people, what happened to you? Because right. when you, when you're in pain, it is, it's so difficult to turn the focus outward. And so if we mm -hmm. continue to have systems that perpetuate this feeling of aloneness, it almost becomes impossible to move forward with empathy in, in a deep connected human way. So you have a long mm -hmm. history with theater and dance and body mm -hmm. movement. And I, and mm -hmm. I can't, I can't imagine that your current uh, practices and trainings don't integrate some of the the somatic work that comes with um, the artistic expression in those ways. And so can we kind of shift into talking about what exactly somatic healing and integration is mm -hmm. as we're talking about not just a neck up approach to healing and integration, mm -hmm. but a full body approach to this? What is What does that look like? What does that mean? Mm-hmm. So that's such a great question. And um, so we think of somatic and a somatic approach is, is, is a human approach. It's a relational approach. It is the body's relationship to the earth. And it's the relationship between living body to living body, our relationship to each other as humans in bodies how our bodies engage with each other and then my relationship to my body to my you know autonomic listening to listening to the signals the sensations the information and the messages from the body because the body is always communicating it's like a baby a newborn that is always giving cues and signals to the caregivers to the mother to the father or the caregivers or the mothers and the mothers and the fathers and the fathers uh, we have fatherers and motherers and mm -hmm. um, so the infant is always giving cues to let everybody know what is happening to me? Because I'm a helpless little one and I really need you to pay attention to my subtle little cues of what I need to stay on this planet and be here with you. 
And so when we have attuned caregivers that are embodied themselves, that are listening to their cues, their somatic cues for, and this is a tall order here for parents, of course, um, is listening to my breathing, listen, you know, noticing my heartbeat, noticing how my feet walk barefoot on, on the floor or on the grass, noticing how my eyes take in the light, noticing how I hear sound, noticing how my body moves, how I pick something up or I've dropped something. How does my body move to pick it up? How do I, you know, step out of bed in the morning? How do my feet touch the ground? These are all cues and these are cues that indigenous humans have lived with for millennia of how they took care of each other, how they listened, how they listened for cues of, of danger. They were in tribal communities and together they heard something rustle in the trees and the ears would perk up and we go, where are the children? Where is everybody? It's a way of taking care of each other. It's relational. And then when the danger is passed, we know, okay, whatever was in the woods that scared us is now past, or we have to you know, get ready to protect ourselves because it could be a, a real life threat. And so embodiment is a way of listening to these profound messages that the bodies are giving us saying, I need you to lie down for 10 minutes, or I need you to go drink some water, for, or I need you to go to the washroom, or I need you to go and touch your partner or ask for connection or ask for some affection, or I need you to go and sit down and read a book for a few minutes or to turn that phone off. It's those subtle cues that help us be alive in life to rest, to take care of our kin, to notice when we need actual protection, to notice how we come into social engagement together. How do we give each other cues hmm. that we're opening our hearts or opening our eyes or opening our spirits to take in your humanity? It is such a, I'm understanding it on such a different level now that the cues of danger that we give to each other through what's called the safety ethic, it's Darsha Narvaez's work, it's brilliant. But when we have unprocessed trauma in the body and we're in protectionist mode, we are expecting more danger and we are acting like danger is happening and we scare each other. Hmm. And when we're, and, and so when we're disembodied, and that starts to come into kind of a disembodiment. And when we become more embodied through somatic practices, somatic meditation, Feldenkrais, yoga, all these beautiful walking, feeling the sun on my back, when we come into these practices and it's hard work, it's hard work to cleanse the perceptions of fear and terror and danger from the body when we're living in it, so many of us living in it, when we can cleanse these perceptions then we can come into an embodied present and not perceive each other as dangerous, but as human, that human, that a human to human living body that needs empathy. And some of us need profound empathy right now, profound levels of it. So, you know, the somatic work is really studying the phenomena of the body, the, the, the phenomena of how the soul and the spirit live in the body. And through this study, we can come to learn how we have organized ourselves through the generations, through our ancestors, to come to know what's been living inside of us, this information mm. that is affecting how we are in this world with each other and with the planet. So that to me is somatic work. And um, it's not just oh, I'm going to listen to my body because if I listen to my body, I might do something really harmful if I've got trauma in the body. <sighs> you know, mm -hmm. people say, oh, I'm just going to listen to my heart or I'm just going to listen to my gut, but my gut might be churning with trauma that I have not processed. So my gut's telling me to leave you where in fact it's mm -hmm. attachment trauma that's happening in there. So it's not always accurate. So it really takes a lot of work to get accurate and precise about what the messages are as we cleanse the body of these old perceptions. And then we've got that beautiful somatic precision and that somatic accuracy of what are we really feeling and differentiating between you and me. We're different how we, how we have gathered ourselves towards life. We've done it differently. And that's the beauty of somatic work is learning how you experience the weather 
differently than how I experienced mm-hmm. the weather. Yeah, I feel I felt lit up when you talked about um leading with our hearts and leading with our guts. If there is trauma underneath that that we're maybe not uh interpreting the signal correctly. And that mm-hmm. is I think in in so many of these self-help circles, that's where a lot of people have these like cautionary tales, right? Where they're like, don't follow your heart. And so then if we are not addressing the trauma underneath that, again, we're just popping ourselves back up into our intellect. And then we're only making, you know, the pros and cons lists and, and all of mm-hmm. that. We're missing out on the information, the, the wide swath of information that is available to us in our body systems. But like you yeah. said, if we, if we're not understanding and healing the the trauma, then we're not interpreting the signals correctly. So how do we, how do we reestablish this, this connection with ourselves, relearn this language? Because I love when you talked about like the baby signaling to its caregivers mm-hmm this is what I need right now. And so all of us have this intrinsic ability to communicate these things. And, and we all know this because the majority of communication is nonverbal. And so, you know, I think they say like 70% of our communication mm-hmm. is nonverbal. So those skills are still there. We just have over time as a result of systems and different ways of thinking about things that we've, we've lost the ability to interpret the signals correctly. And I love what you said about if, if we are in a state ourselves of fear or protectiveness, that is what we are signaling to the other people mm-hmm. in our, in our pod, you know, and, and mm-hmm. if we're, you know, with, with our nonverbal language and our body language and our words, if we're communicating to someone else, like be on high alert, <laughs> then we're just perpetuating a mm-hmm. sense of unease mm-hmm. and unsafety. Mm-hmm. And I think that that is probably one of the big things that contributes to polarization, because Mm -hmm. if everybody's in this state of us and them, they're out to get me, then all it's going to do is just continue to make people be in these heightened states of stay away from everybody else. Absolutely. Absolutely. And it's such a double-edged sword. It's such a crazy time right now because we have another shooting. We just had a shooting in Prague at a university in Prague and, and he, he, here it is. And so what happens is immediately people say we need more security and saying, oh, we need more security. We need more protections. And again, we're perpetuating over and over again, this idea that people are getting more and more dangerous. And so we need more security from each other. That is that cyclical problem that we are entering right now. And so with more security, we get more scared. Hmm. And so I'm trying to understand in my small way and the small ways that I can interact with uh, the cohorts that I teach or the groups that I facilitate is how do I walk into a room? And this is what was a great learning for me because I went through complex post-traumatic stress um, during COVID for about two and a half years. And I realized that in complex post-traumatic stress, there's two things going on, two things, a multitude of things. At least two things. (laughs) Two things going on. You feel like there's an enemy within and you can also feel like there's an enemy without, right? And so it can oscillate back and forth between this enemy within and this enemy without. And so there's this heightened sympathetic coming through, even as I can, you know, be friendly and warm, but there's this contraction on the inside. There's this protection. And I went through that. I I had days where I thought, shit, I think every student I have is going to attack me eventually. And based in sometimes reality and sometimes in the trauma that I grew up with when my mother was in her full-blown trauma herself and she did attack. Um, But I knew that there was no way that I was going to be able to keep teaching until I reconciled this terror in my own system, this terror I had of people and that it got exacerbated by some situations that I was going to have to heal in the past and heal in the present and go through the painstaking 
uncomfortable, horrendous feeling of what terror feels like in my nervous system and meet it moment by moment with therapists I trust, also some psychedelic work as well, and make my body safe to myself and make my body safe to other people. Because when I was in perceptions of danger and fear, I had an edge to me. People can feel that edge. So they don't feel totally safe. They don't feel totally comfortable. No matter how warm and fun I am, they can feel its energy internally. It's like two wild animals, right? Who's going to attack first? Hmm. Right? You get two wild animals that are scared, they're going to attack. So we're creating these energies of attack because of what's living in the system. And so it was profound for me to go, I can't wait for my students to cleanse the traumas or projections. I can't wait for the environment to be safe. I have to do that inside of me, in my own perceptions, so that I come into a room, they're feeling safe, and they catch the contagion hmm. of that safety. And then we start to resource together, and then we start to synchronize together, and then we feel that. And so when something does come up, I've got the embodied resource, the grounding, the source within that softens it for me. I can go to the earth or I can turn to my assistant. I need say, I need, I can see a transference coming up. I need your help here. But if I walk in scared as a leader, if I walk in contracted and tense with residue of terror inside me, people are going to feel that. They'll feel it in my eyes. They'll feel it in my face. They'll feel it in my in my voice, in my chest, in my body, in the contractions, in my hip flexors, and they're going to be uncomfortable. And eventually someone's going to enter an enactment or enter a, a you know, transference. It's going to happen. So it's always a great gauge for me to come back and go, ah, what, what, what work does my body need to do here right now? Uh, someone's something's coming up for somebody. And it's not about making myself responsible, but it's it's the way that I can help mitigate the energy. If a projection or transference does come up, I know I'm solid in my body and I'm not catching the contagion and I can then be there with empathy and love for that person. So we catch these contagions all the time. I mean, you mm -hmm. see the contagion of gun violence. It's it's a contagion. It's unbelievable. It's, it's, it's in freaking Hollywood. I mean, you know, honestly, we talk about you know, um, you know, f being able to create art and, you know, it, you know, put anything on the screen, show what's there. Right. But we have to be thoughtful of what are we actually putting out there? What are the messages that we're giving young people? I'm, I'm appalled. Honestly, I'm appalled. I go to the movie theaters and I walk out of movies because it's like, I, I do not want to see another person solving their problems by picking up a gun and blasting people. How can we not pick that up? Like, how is it not possible that it's not getting into our brains and into the brains of young people where that's what they're seeing is how we solve our problems? It's so sexy. It's so immediate. It's so a good discharge, right? I, it's, not, it's, not, it's not strange to me that this is happening because it's how we're glorifying it. When we're embodied, we can't do that to another person. When we're embodied, we go, oh my God, that's hurting you. Oh my God, I can't do that because you're another human being and you're a value. I couldn't possibly do that. When we feel our value as human beings, we can't do that to someone else when we're embodied. That makes me wonder, you know, like when, <clears throat> when it comes to the things that we watch, we assume that our minds know that it's fake. And I wonder if that's if that contributes to people feeling like, well, it doesn't really matter what I consume visually. It doesn't really matter what I consume auditorily because my brain knows that it's fake. And the the tricky part is, is that our brains don't always know that it's fake <laughs> because the feelings that that's arise right. when yeah. we're watching something are real in our bodies. Yeah. And that yeah. is what programs that fight or flight, that, that is what programs us to be on alert for danger. And so if we are putting ourselves in these situations, I mean, everybody loves a good movie that brings up some type of emotional response, whether it's a love mm -hmm. story or it's sad, totally. you know, that is, that yeah. is what 
that's what we love about movies. And so we mm-hmm. cannot, we cannot brush away what's happening in our subconscious minds when we, when we feed ourselves any number of different things. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I, I, you know, see- it's, it's exactly what you were saying is that when an actor goes on, on set, <clears throat> that physiology is very real when they're having sort of a, a, a love scene or a sex scene or a, or a fight scene, they are experiencing the physiology. This is why they need really good therapists because mm. they've gone through these chemical changes in their bodies to go into a scene and they need to be able to restore themselves to homeostasis. So they're not walking out with the energy of what they just played out in a scene. Right. Mm. Yeah. So if we're, if we're not being very wise about gatekeeping, yeah. Our, our nervous system and our, um, and the somatic work, if we're not super intentional about that, we can allow all sorts of things to flood our nervous systems with yeah. all sorts of different emotions. So when, when you, when you are talking about seeing, seeing your, your behavior and seeing how your body feels in certain circumstances, and it's alerting you that something needs attention here. Yeah. Something needs attention how do we go about giving that attention? How do we go about um, uncovering what's happening beneath the the conscious surface? And I and I think this is a great segue into mm-hmm. into somatic healing and also into psychedelics, mm-hmm. because there is a whole mess of things happening below the surface that we're not consciously aware of. Mm-hmm. That again, if we're not dressing, addressing everything that is below the surface, we're we're really not doing the work that is going to last and is going to make really big changes in our relationships and our world. So let's let's talk about mm-hmm. that a little bit. Like mm-hmm. when when you become aware of something happening in your body that needs attention, how do you go mm-hmm. about addressing it? Yeah. So um I want to just take a minute to reflect on all the different situations and scenarios that people find themselves in, meaning some people uh, find themselves living alone. Some people find themselves living on the street. Some people find themselves living in refugee camps. Some people, their house was just blown to smithereens. And for every single person in that body, they're feeling something either nothing because they've gone completely numb and collapsed um, or they're in rage or they're in profound grief. So I just wanted to sort of realize that I'm very fortunate to be able to be in this lovely studio and home where when I have something go on somatically in my body, I've got a really nice space that I can be in. Mm -hmm. I've got a husband of 22 years that I just absolutely adore that I can message him and say, I'm noticing something's going on in my heart and he'll send a heart back. So I I want to answer from this place of, you know, the privilege that I have to be able to attend to my body and the sensations that are coming up, knowing that other people are probably living with decades of terror. So what is the context So in this context, in a context in a world of privilege where I can, I've got great therapists that I can fortunately pay for, and I've got a really great community that I've built. One of the things that we need um, to pay attention to our bodies, we need other people with us. And that's painful if you're living alone. That's a painful because it's likely the fact that people weren't there for you to pay attention with you that ended that, that you ended up living alone. Because people need each other. We need each other to reflect, to co-reflect, to help us make sense of what's coming up. And that's what the caregiver, the motherer, and the fatherer does for the infant to help them make sense of what they're feeling. Not telling them, but help them make sense of sensation, make sense of the signals my body are giving me. Because making sense isn't just going, oh, I'm having a heart attack, go to the doctor, we have to do operations or medications. Making sense of the body means, like, I've got heart stuff going on right now, and I'm actually not going to a doctor. And I know this is really probably bad advice for your listeners. I have different ways of going about this. 
I am picking apart a lot of deep terror that's lived in my heart muscle that's mm. presenting as symptoms that I would want to see a cardiologist for, but that's not the way I work for myself. And it doesn't mean I wouldn't send a client to a cardiologist. I would. But I, in the knowing that something's going on, I've done something I haven't done before, which is I've reached out to four of my friends and I said, hey, I just want to let you know there's something up with my heart. If perchance my husband's gone away for Christmas, he's with his parents, and that's just an agreement that we've made. If perchance I don't, I can't call an ambulance in time and, and I text you help, then just someone respond to me or come and check on me. So it's a relational thing, first of all. I'm going, I'm going, having his sensations. I need to let somebody know. The other part of it is not to assume that the body is sending me a negative message. We have this crazy way that we have pathologized the messages of the body, and I can immediately go, People get like that. They get like, oh my God, something's happening in my... And, and I say this with empathy because people who have undergone cancer treatment, oh my God, every little thing can be so terrifying that what's happening now, what's happening now? And I work with clients and I say, hey, you're actually going through a release right now. This is a good sign. So I want to say is that we can't assume immediately that it's a negative message from the body, but it might be a message from the body that goes... I am screaming for you to listen to me. My heart's pounding so hard because I've spent my whole time not listening to my heart because that's the way I survived my childhood because it would have been too painful to feel the excruciating sorrow in my family. That now when my body starts talking to me, it's actually saying, I need you to slow down because you're missing something. You're missing something really big right now. And until you slow this down, your heart is not going to be able to communicate something profound. And so some days I need to put myself in a cold plunge because the symptoms are kind of big and I need to support my heart. Some days I need to dance and move because I need to shake off some adrenal energy because it's kind of in that cycle of being adrenalized. I feel the squeeze of my life right now. There's a lot I'm doing. So there's a squeeze going on. It's mobilizing to trying to get stuff done when, I, when really I want to rest. So then I got to go, oh, you need to lie down on the ground and actually get your heart supported by the ground. You need something underneath it to hold it. So sometimes it's, what do I do for myself? And some days I go, it's not co-regulating right now. It is not responding to the ground. It's not responding to dance. It's not responding to a cold plunge. You got something deeper going on. There's a trauma here that's living underneath. That's where I go to psychedelics. And I uh, recently worked touchy subject right now, ketamine with Matthew Matthew Perry. Is that is that the right? Did I get the name mm -hmm. right of the actor that just died? Mm -hmm. Heart condition, took ketamine, was in a ketamine trial. Anyway, ended up um, dying. So recently I was doing a very small, small dose, 15 milligrams of ketamine, um, at the end, tail end of a ceremony with my husband, where we sat for eight hours, states of the heart, talking back and forth uh, about, you know, we've been together 22 years. What's, what are we uncovering here together? And uh, about six hours in, I did a small line of ketamine and it went right down to my heart. And I could feel it. I could feel literally in that moment, the sorrow that I was born into. My, It's a long history. My parents are, are Hungarian. They went through the Second World War, the Soviet occupation, the reign of terror, Hungarian revolution. My aunt, mother ends a big, long separation. My mother ends up in Canada. And I'm born a year later after she's separated from all her family. Mm. And I could feel in that moment holy, my heart grew up in sorrow, profound sorrow. And I could feel how it had frozen, I literally frozen into the cells of a chamber of my heart. And the ketamine softened enough that I was like, oh, this is excruciating. I could feel it. And I kind of would soften and then I'd move and I did this kind of movement 
this kind of undulating movement to try to move it through. And then there was this burning sensation in my lungs. And I went, no wonder I smoked for 30 years. Good. There was such a burn that came up. Long story short, it's, um, it's complex work to approach the messages of the body, but we can start in simple ways by taking our socks off, putting our feet on the ground, putting our feet in the, in the, in the snow, putting our feet on the grass, putting our feet in the water, putting our feet on the ground and start reacquainting ourselves with the connection of nerves and cells and earth to start feeling again, feeling again these connections, this ground, so that when things start to rush up, I can hit the ground, I can go down to the ground, put my heart on the ground, put my heart, belly on the ground. These ways that I can start to, if there's nobody with me, hold, you know, get my hands on mm. a tree, hold my pet, <laughs> hold my pet or something, or stare at the tree that I'm seeing or at the sun, find those ways that we can connect with the living world around us to come into relationship with the living world around us to help slow down the surge of ancestral trauma and the surge of our collective trauma that's coming up through our bodies. And then how do we find the people? How do we find the communities or my knitting group or my art group or my writing group or my reading group? Some way that we can be in synchronizing our physiologies for when people are having a difficult time because we live in a culture right now that you're too much for me go to your therapist come back when you're better hmm. which means we are not embodying together and we have to embody together we can't wait for someone to be better to welcome back, them back into a community which means we all have to do embodiment work because it's going to be intense it's going to be intense to be in community together that was a really long-winded answer about somatics, but mm. that's the way I'm thinking about it these days. Thank you for sharing sharing all of that. What I wrote down was the signals from our body aren't necessarily signals that something is wrong. Mm -hmm. That is that's profound um, because we we live in a time where we have access to not only, you know, so many coping, <laughs> unhealthy coping <laughs> strategies, but that we also, that's, we go to the doctor to stop feeling pain. Mm -hmm. We, we let the pain be a signal that something's wrong that needs to be fixed. And we don't have the tools to know how to ask some questions internally mm -hmm before we seek out someone else to give us the answers. That's right. So when we do the work to dial up our curiosity mm -hmm. and to stop viewing the signals of pain in particular that our body is sending us as the enemy, that's because right. that internal chaos, that's, there's nothing, there's nothing matched by that. The external breakdown in relationships and, and turmoil doesn't have anything on the internal turmoil. And so we're all looking oh for ways God. to address that. And, yeah. and if we don't, if we, if we lack the tools to do that, then we just keep pressing down, pressing down, pressing down all those mm -hmm. important body signals. So I, I love yeah. that. That is going to be such a good takeaway for me. And I, and I suspect for many of the people listening to this, that when, when a signal comes up from our bodies, even if it's uncomfortable, even mm -hmm. if it's painful, that doesn't mean that there's something wrong. It just is an invitation to start to ask more questions. There, right. There's a lot of, um, you know, the compassionate in inquiry, the internal family systems, that all of that sounds right along these same lines of asking questions, asking better mm -hmm. questions of ourselves about what's coming up. Absolutely. And um, I wanted to say as well that 
to, 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 we have to learn to differentiate. I mean, you know, sitting on my leg and it's pins and needles. Mm. Yeah. That that's actually telling me that this is not a good thing. Get off, get off your leg and listen <laughs> sooner. Right. That, that, that's actually not so good. However, we have other signals that are asking for co-regulation and before we can, and this is so important because so many, um, we can get too overly zealous by going to the trauma and the core of trauma too quickly. Mm. And we need, and that's happened to me. I used to do that. I used to be like, so it's like, I can see it. I can help the client get there. And they walk out of their session and they feel hit by a bus, right? Because we just went to the trauma far too quickly to the core of it. We need a significant amount of co-regulation before we can go into the trauma that's living in the body, the terror that's living in the body. We need a significant amount of relationship building before we can actually let people into those excruciatingly vulnerable places. So sometimes, yes, we need to ask the questions, but sometimes it's a lot of silence. It's a lot of quiet. It's a lot of looking at the tiniest nuance in the eyes and the voice and the face and the feeling that transmission between bodies of what's happening in there for that body and what is needed. The question is what is needed right now to help co-regulate that body where they can come into enough homeostasis to then dive into hmm. slowly at their timing the traumas that are living within. What, so sometimes it's like, I'll spend a year co-regulating with a client before we even go to touch on trauma. Can you describe a little bit more what co-regulating is, what that means? Absolutely. So uh, for example, I'm working with a client right now where her trauma is really, really up. And I'm not even going there right now about asking her about her past or anything. I mean, she gives me enough little details. I don't need to know more. It's enough. But as she comes in, she's moving quickly. She's wired. Like there's a sense of wired. And she can't find ground. And her hands are actually touching the ground. She's actually putting her hands on the ground. You can see the wisdom in the body going, I need to get to ground, even though I'm wired up and I can't cope. And I've got like crazy humans around me that are sending me horrible messages. And so I'm thinking, how do we get gear down, help her body gear down towards the ground so she can feel herself again? Because in that state of danger and life threat, the heart's coming up. She's vibrating. She's, her brain's not functioning properly. She can't sense what reality is. And so co-regulating is helping her go can you feel me here with you? Mm. We're in this room together. We're, we're right here together. Can you feel my presence here with you? Yeah, I can. And it's really good. And what's it like for you to be in this room right now? Is there anything that's pleasant in the room? She goes, oh, this whole room is pleasant. Okay, great. So you know that you like the feel of the room. So she's starting to come. And I said, how, how about we just look around a little bit and just take in the light, take in what's in the room and her attention starts to shift a little bit. She's not in this, like, what am I going to do? She kind of slows and starts to take in more because when we're in trauma, we're, our, our eyes are focused like this or we're, or we're shut down. We've gone offline. So you see her eyes traveling in the room and taking in where she is and this, see this breath come in. She's shifting from autonomic nervous system state, from panic, from life threat, from danger coming down into co-regulation which is social engagement dorsal which means immobilizing she's coming out of the panic stricken running to stillness to her eyes come up and she looks at him she goes hi I'm like hi here we are the heart starts to slow a little bit now her starts to slow she's touching the ground and then, then you can see that she's gearing down. She's not going, you know, I speak in kilometers, 120 kilometers an hour. She's coming down into slowing, gearing down, coming into the school zone, driving slower. <laughs> and then we can start to connect. We can start to kind of be here together now. 
because you can't solve your problems. You can't solve anything when you're in high arousal, when you're in panic. You can't work with trauma there because it just gets overly triggered. So co-regulation is the soothing. It's to come into rhythm together. It's what you do when you soothe a baby. The baby comes into rhythm. It settles. It goes. <sighs> mm. <sighs> and then it starts to yield its body. It starts to yield its body into connection. So co-regulation essentially is coming into human connection. It's coming into human connection with your body, human connection with your with people so that you're feeling safe and settled together, that you are protecting each other. You're, you're, you're in allyship. So it's bringing the heart down. It's bringing the sense of feeling the ground, feeling your body, because when you're dysregulated, you can't feel it or you feel like you're got electricity surging through you or you're just numb and shut down. You're just not even there. You don't even have a body. So co-regulation is the very profound, slow work of coming back into human connection, body connection, and a sense of, oh, okay, I can start to feel my body again for even a second, for even a second. And for even a second, I can feel that you're here with me before my trauma starts to take me out again, before I panic about what am I going to do about my son. So for moments... For a moment, we can come into alignment. This, so it's essentially co-regulation <laughs> leads to homeostasis. Yeah. It's interesting to, to hear how to do this with another person because this, you know, I've I've talked pretty openly on this podcast about anxiety and about panic attacks that, you know, have, have become part of my life in the last handful of years, much to my surprise. And some of these tools and techniques of, you know, getting dialed into my surroundings, feeling what the temperature of the room is to get me out of this swirling pattern and back into my body. I've utilized myself, but I don't think that I realized until this conversation, how profoundly important it is to do that with someone else. Like I think about with my kids when, when they're at like a 10 emotionally, if I come in intellectually, there's, there's no connection there. It's, it's a complete disconnection because they can't totally. hear me That's right. when they're in that state. And so it's not that I'm coming into also heightened emotional state, the same place that they're, if they're yelling, I'm yelling, if they're yelling, I'm yelling, you know, that's just that's right. escalating all of it. But if I'm coming in with calm body language, if I'm coming in with calm words, if I'm bringing them back into their own bodies and into their mm -hmm. environment, then mm -hmm. that's, and that's what it sounds like to me is like, that's mm -hmm. the co-regulation. It's, it's together that's dialing right. down the hyper excited state into yes. something where you then can connect on a, on a different level, but you have to first connect on the, the physiological, on the emotional level in order to then have the verbal communication about the circumstance. That's right. It's somatic consciousness. It's somatic attunement. It's somatically attuning to what's the neural state of my child right now. Are they in a neural state of safety? Are they in a neural state of mm -hmm. danger? Are they in the neural state of life threat? Or are they like locked into all of these at once? <laughs> they're, they're like... Mm -hmm. They, you know, they're playing and then they hit each other and all of a sudden they're in the neural state of danger and social engagement <laughs> in a bind together. Right. Mm. And I, I really, for me, I really like to use the word practice that is, a, it is a practice and it takes it into the world of humanity that practice is an accumulation that it, that the co-regulate self-regulation is an accumulation of co-regulation. We don't have, a baby doesn't have self-regulation. Hmm. A baby accumulates self-regulation through co-regulation, through the caregivers. And so we need co-regulation over a lifetime. We don't just get regulated. We actually need people together. This is why drum circles are so beautiful. You come in, I go to this beautiful drum circle in Calgary where I live um, every Friday night. I don't go every Friday night, but they have it. It's been going for 25 years. And you go in there, even talking about it, I'm starting to tingle this beautiful room and circles of people 
It's called rhythms of cir uh, circles of rhythm. And you come and you're beating the drum together and you feel this rhythm and this cooperation and you feel the collaboration and you can feel that there's something happening in your cells. You're co-regulating. You are organizing rhythm. Violence is a rhythmic. Rhythm doesn't have a, vi a, a rhythm to it. You hear gunshots. They're not rhythmic. You hear boom, blast, boo, boo, boo. You see punching is not rhythmic. It's just chaotic. But when we drum, when we come together and drum, we start to bring the cells back into rhythm together. Dancing does that. And then we start to feel like we're connected as people, that we're safe together in this rhythm, this synchrony through the cells. Mm -hmm. And so that's co-regulation. It's so satisfying. Um, and eat and in therapy that's where we need to start we need to start with noticing the neural state of the client noticing arousal cues in the client noticing them in ourselves what is our neural state what are our arousal cues you know i get very excited you know energy comes up mm -hmm. i get passionate it comes up and then i have to bring it down because it could be overwhelming for people so i have to know when it comes up and then self regulate it know that i'm in relationship right so regulation is a very relational practice and it's over time. And it's, I think it's how we're going to save the planet, not through psychedelics. I think psych mm. people think psychedelics are going to save the planet. I think it's a great start, but psychedelics don't co-regulate us. Humans co-regulate us. Nature co-regulates us so that we can self-regulate when we find ourselves alone without a person to rely on. Mm. Having this this conversation about co-regulation makes me think about like how many people have relational friction with their partner, yeah. with their spouse, um, because of this same kind of dynamic, like what I'm talking about with my kids, you yeah. know, where one person comes with something that's really big and emotional and important to them. And then they leave the conversation feeling more alone than ever because, yeah. because both people have not learned how to just be with the other person and not yeah. try to fix things right off the bat or not try totally. to talk them out of how they feel. You know, I'm, I'm, a, I know. that's one of my problems for sure is I'm like, let, let me talk about why this doesn't need to feel like such a big yeah. deal to you. And that is so yeah. counterproductive because that's, that's really mm -hmm. not what we're asking for in those moments. What we're asking for in those moments is to not be alone with that internal pain and discomfort. And when you talked about being with your client and having her touching the the ground with her hands, I thought this this image came up of of what it's like when you are feeling like that emotionally, where you're where you're really down and someone just gets down on their hands and knees right next to you yeah. and says, I'm right here for as yeah. long as you need, as you're yeah. feeling like this, I'm right here yeah. with you. Yeah. There's no need to solve anything. There's no need to talk about anything. Nope. Just know that you're not alone. Exactly. Living body to living body, the sense that someone's getting me, mm. getting my internal world. That's what, so, that's what the intersubjective relational field is all about. That's Alan Shore's work. It's beautiful, brilliant work, but it's that sense that as therapists, we have to build such a strong embodiment practice to be able to get a sense of the inner world of the other that volcano that's erupting on the inside that the sparks that are spewing this is iceland right now you know mm. i'm really feeling for my icelandic friends what the, the, the spectacular and horrific thing that's going on but um th this is a very distinct practice that helps people get gotten mm. for someone to get this turmoil that's going inside the we ask the questions like what does that feel like in there how do we build the language to speak of such elusive internal feelings that's why we have to build the language around sensations and show it sometimes with our hands because we don't have the word for it you know that nonverbal communication you know i had a client lovely human a doctor I was working with a doctor and she was in the throes of PTSD and I, she came in I was like oh god I know it like I had I've lived through that I just got it. my eyes just went oh I know it. oh I have a sense of what you're feeling right now and she just came in and, and you know being a doctor she didn't want to like break down but she, she I just looked at her and I went and she just broke down and of course the apologies of her breaking down I said this, this is why you're here 
this is exactly this is the you know the clouds hold whatever they hold before water falls before rain falls the tension and I said you know it's falling like rain and um she sat down and I said would you be up for me sitting beside you right now and she goes would you and I just sat there shoulder to shoulder and I just pressed my shoulder into her. She pressed her shoulder in and she goes, oh, thank you. I said, just need another human to press shoulder to shoulder. And I said, I'm just going to sit here. For, we're just going to sit here for a few minutes, just like this, shoulder to shoulder. And then I, I said, I, I, I'm just going to take my hand. I'm going to put it around your shoulder. She goes, would you? And I said, yeah. And I'm just going to like take the, this, you know, just this sitting together. And she's just like, oh. Thank you. There was a part of her that was so young that just needed to be held. And then I just, mm -hmm. how you doing now? And I just take my hand away, move back, move back, give her the dignity to return to her adult self. And, mm -hmm. and she goes, thank you. I'm like, great. Sometimes you just need to hold somebody's hand. Just go, oh, okay, what's the neural state that's here? How do I kind of stay in my own subjectivity? I don't catch the contagion. Stay in my own ground itself as I go, oh, that's, oh. So with kids, with younger people who have a lot of energy, sometimes it's like, let's jump up and down and get some of that energy. Oh, let's like actually get some energy or cut a jog on the spot or take a good bike ride or dance. So what if we dance this out a little bit so that we get some of that adrenal energy out until they're pooped, you know? Hmm. Um, not violent energy not aggressive not, not that dysregulate more but consciously how do we start oh, i might bounce with you a little bit hmm. <laughs> right. and, and not trying to get the person away from there but just to kind of meet them there and inquire together right now like what is needed here right now what is needed i'm going to try to get this for you get where you're at and what is needed to help you co-regulate let's find that out together hmm. might might my client, I didn't suggest my client touch the ground. She was already touching the ground and mm. I amplified that. And I said, oh, I've noticed you're touching the ground. How does, how was, what's that like for you? And they're like, yeah. And I, I touched, can I touch the ground with you? They're like, yeah, that'd be great. And we're just both there touching the ground, seeing what, mm. in that mutuality. We're doing so it together. For, for people who would self-identify as, you know, deeply empathetic and have, have learned perhaps through some trauma to, to be hyper aware of how other people are doing, mm -hmm. how, how do people avoid taking on what's not theirs? So you talked about, you just briefly touched on that, like making sure that you're always connecting with yourself to make sure that you're not taking on stuff yeah. that's not yours. So what are some like really practical ways that you can I don't, I don't want to say like armor yourself up because it's yeah. not that, but it's. No, it's not. I'm so yeah. glad you said that. It's not. You know, it's a really cool way and, and and we can do it together. And I learned this beautiful practice through my teacher, Sharon Stanley, is it's called, it's the figure eight. And we can do it together here right now. Um, so it's a way to differentiate our energies. It's a way that we stay connected, but we differentiate. So I'm going to imagine, and we're going to do it at the same time. Um, I'm going to imagine that I'm going to lasso put a little lasso around myself. I'm not going to do it with my finger. I'm going to imagine it, but I'll just show you. I'll lasso around my body. And then I will lasso the energy around your body. And then I'm going to lasso around mine. And then you're going to lasso around, I'm going to lasso around yours. And you're going to do it at exactly the same time where you're going to lasso the energy around your body, kind of like creating a little boundary around your body. And then you're going to create a little boundary around mine. So Let's just do that together for a moment. You're going to start with yourself and I'm going to start with myself. And we can do it eyes open. We can do it eyes closed. You can do a combination of both. But just that sense that I'm going to take care of my own energy first. And I'm just kind of imagining it, slowing it down. And you can do this for yourself first and then around my body. And we're just kind of slowing that energy down to really differentiate between our bodies. 
while we stay in connection together. It only takes a few seconds, but I kind of wonder what occurred for you, what happened for you. Hmm. I was very surprised to have some fear come up. Uh -huh. um, a little feeling of being scared of only being with myself. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. For mm -hmm. that first little loop there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then what happened after that? I think I just noticed that and mm -hmm. kind of I, I thought, uh, I'll just tuck that away for later. I'll come back to that. And investigate yeah, a little yeah, bit more. Yeah. And then and then what happened when you lassoed around me? I'm curious. Oh, that so I think that sensation came up after I already had, you know, separated <sighs> us. Um, uh -huh. where I was like, I don't want to be alone. I don't want to be by myself over here in this part yeah. of the lasso. Yeah. yeah. Interesting. Yeah. It's so beautiful and and so subtle. Mm -hmm. these practices they bring up so much information and there it is it's coming up out of the body right mm -hmm. you've had that moment for it to be safe enough or quiet enough for that to come up and the beauty of that is that you can do that it's you know you can do that when you're seeing your child is having a moment where you just gently mm -hmm. lasso around yourself and around your child you're not it's, there's no violation here there's no invasion no there's no energetic invasion it's a kindness to just kind of lasso them and say, I'm not going to catch the contagion, but I'm going to just lasso you in with me a little bit here, stay in connection while I differentiate you. And you asked how empathic people, how do they get to know and differentiate themselves from people when they're picking stuff up? This is one practice. Another one is creating a little bit of a membrane around ourselves, that energetic membrane where we can see out still. We can hear, we have a we sense of temperature of our own bodies within the membrane. But also the study, we have to study the phenomena of our own bodies. We need to get to know how our bodies organize or respond to things, our particular messages. If I don't get to know mine, then I'm going to blend with yours. Mm. And so when we have a really good practice at it, then I can go oh my God, I just, you know, read the latest thing or right now, well, it's going to call Vladimir Zelensky. I see photographs. Sometimes I see a photograph of his face and I just go, oh, you know, this young, young president of the Ukraine who was a comedian and, you know, he was an entertainer and now he's leading his country through war and I'll look at his face and then I'll hold my heart. And I'll, I'll kind of feel his sorrow in his eyes. I can see the sorrow in his eyes at times and the fatigue in his eyes. And then I go, oh, that really hits my, that really hits my sadness of what my parents went through, you know, in the, in the fifties in Hungary. And then I kind of, ooh, create a little separation here. Just this sense that I'm going to hold mine as I also witness his. It's that one eye in and the one eye out, the differentiation mm -hmm. And not going, oh, oh, the poor guy. And oh, now I absorb it and I pull it in this way. We aren't empathic until we are present. When I go out of presence for you by absorbing your emotions, I've gone out of presence for you. Hmm. By absorbing all your grief, I've gone out of presence for you. Hmm. I can say what you're telling me is heartbreaking. This is heartbreaking what you're going through, or this is heartbreaking that part of you that doesn't want to be alone. But if I start to go, oh, let me take that away from you. Oh, let me take that. Oh, then I'm out of presence for you. So I can go, oh, God, that's heartbreaking. Can I be here with you right now? Hmm. And then I anchor into my own body to be here with you right now. So one little thing for empaths, definitely a membrane, that sense of the own, your own weather, the temperature in your own body, that beautiful membrane where you can see out, but it's not absorbing through the membrane. It's porous enough that you can take in, but not so porous that you're collapsing from it. And um, that sense of one eye in and one eye out, seeing my own 
body responses as, I, as I'm noticing yours and ref you can see my my pattern of hesitating telling people how I'm really doing yeah. because I'm worried about that about you know someone else then getting super sad <laughs> and yeah. then feeling like I need to take care of them yeah and so these yeah. I'm so grateful for for you sharing some really practical ways mm -hmm. for mm -hmm. us to know how to effectively co-regulate. Yeah. Because yeah. I think that that's what people want. People want to do that with the people that they love and they they want to create connection and, and, and homeostasis in their relationships, but we're sorely lacking the skills to know how to do that. <laughs> totally. The skills and the practices and... Mm -hmm. You know, I, I, I was actually very touched by what you just said there, um, that you're afraid to tell people how you're really feeling because, you know, some part of you is concerned about misattunement, mm. getting what you don't need in that moment. It's almost worse. It's almost worse than getting nothing. Getting what you don't need is almost worse than nothing at times, right? That yes. misattunement. And it, it keeps people in a real quandary. And I'm really touched by your quandary because we have to practice such discernment at who we trust to speak to about this. Do they have the skills? Do they have the presence? Do they have the embodiment? Do they have the curiosity just to be with me? And there was a lot, many years of discomfort and frustration between my husband and I trying to learn this because he tried to go into problem solving mm -hmm. and I'd be frustrated with him. He's not doing it right. And he's like, I'm not doing it right. Blah, blah, blah. This back and forth until we both started to understand this idea. We read books about it around co-regulation. I learned about it in my work, in my therapeutic work. And then we started to really understand for him, he needs a hug. That's where he's, he's mm -hmm. good. For me, I just need you to sit, just listen, just hear me out. Just be with me. Don't feel like you're about to run away. Just be with me. I'm good. Let me just describe what's happening. I know your presence. I'm good. I got it. Hmm. Other people might just need a holding. It's so simple. It's actually so simple to just go, oh, I'm just moved by what you just said to me. Hmm. Huh. Or God, thank you for sharing that vulnerable, delicate little place with me huh, just go, huh, like, wow, wow, that's in you. Hmm. That, this is such a great tie-in with the very first part of the conversation that we had about understanding what it is to be a humane human. Mm -hmm. I think th that's pretty much it is, huh, I didn't know that was in you. Yeah. And that there can be so much love <laughs> and there can be so much empathy and compassion to say oh I didn't know that I didn't know that was there thank you for showing mm -hmm. that to me mm -hmm. and in the in the mutual like I just I have this image of like cracking open your chest just a little bit to like let yeah. the light out and and if someone sees that and says show me more oh what a gift that is for for someone to to pursue our inner life with mm -hmm. curiosity and love and compassion, because all that does is open you up more, which just mm -hmm. lets more of the light out and more of the light in that. I mean, yeah. that's what, that's yeah. to me, what it means to be human is mm -hmm. to, mm -hmm. to be in that together and say like everything that you, all of your behavior makes perfect sense for what you've gone through. Mm -hmm. All of your choices. Totally. Of course, if I was yeah. you, I would be you. <laughs> I would do that exact totally. same thing if I had the history yeah. and the generational trauma yeah. and all the things yeah. that I would do that exactly. And that's what it means to be in this human soup together is that it, there is no other. There is only me. There is only mm. you mm -hmm. because we're the same. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh. Yeah. It's, it's heart matters. It's the matters of the heart, isn't it? It's deep in the heart. Mm. it's so deep in the heart. Mm. 
I don't, I, can't, I don't even feel like there's anything that we can say. That, I just like, love the way you brought it to back to the beginning. That. You're really, you're really good at this. Oh, thank you. It's, <laughs> it's so satisfying you, for me. <laughs> you're but such a delightful kind of person to talk to. Oh, it's, it's a mutual, it's a, it's a shared, a shared, shared growing love here. Hmm. Well, before, um, I guess before we wrap up, I I'll ask what, what is something that, um, I guess that you're, you're excited about right now that has made maybe like a really positive impact on you. Just, I don't know, and maybe in the, in the last handful of years or in the last year that has surprised you or delighted you that just lights you up. <laughs> interesting question that you ask actually I will I know <laughs> that's funny because I just came through a very dark passage and it was a lot of work mm. to come through and uh you know I, I I wouldn't undo it but um you know I was I was down in Australia I was teaching there last this past year and um I got to sit with the plant medicine acacia which is their their uh, version of ayahuasca Hmm. And it's a tree, it's a plant, a tree that reaches towards the light, reaches towards the sky. And uh, I went in there knowing that, you know, I just kind of come out of PTSD. I didn't want too rough of a ride. I asked for a medium dose from the shaman. And, you know, as the shaman was in there with the didgeridoo and the music and hmm. the medicine was taking a long time coming on, I thought, oh, I might just not have anything tonight, which is okay too. And then the medicine went in there and started pulling all these dark places out. Just just had its way. It pulled from my lungs. I used to smoke cigarettes. It was still cleaning me out. I quit two, 20 years ago. It still found some residue in my lungs. I was like, oh, this is brilliant. But it, it was it was like, oh, gosh, this is hard stuff. Oh, you're making me look at that. Oh, you're making me look at that. Oh, God. Oh, really? Oh, geez. After I just said, okay, go for it. Just do it. Huh. Then I spent... One hour after that, laughing my head off. It was just the best laughter. I was like an unruly child. My husband's trying to journey. I've got my friend who's sitting for me. <laughs> and I and she, and I and she says, I said, it's ridiculous. And she said, What's ridiculous? I said, the didgeridoo is ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> and there was a part of me that just let me let like this laughter sprung forward. It's who I mm. am. It's who I am, right? I can be so heavy. I, I've got such a heavy history, but I laughed and I let myself laugh and I didn't care. And I could hear my husband was in serious work, but he was laughing and the shaman started laughing and my friends started laughing. And I mm. said, I was going to say swear in a fun way, but when you can laugh, let the laughter out and let it just rip through the body and see the ridiculousness. And you, and you don't know why it's ridiculous. It is just ridiculous. It's that, that funny bone, that thing that you go, I don't know, all of this is, even that I'm here, this is ridiculous. It was such a release. And the beauty of it was when I found that, that, that delight again, that light coming mm -hmm. back in. I came a week later and I was leading a women's group and they were doing a different plant medicine here with me. And there was a client, German, you know, heavy, heavy history. So heavy. And I told her about my experience down there just a little bit. You know, I, I said, you know, you can have a heavy experience and you might have a light experience. And strangely, she caught the contagion. She went to the super dark place, worked that out. And then she came out and she was giggling for an hour in the room. She couldn't mm. stop it. And you could feel the giggles going through the room. Everyone's doing heavy work, but somehow we had to laugh. Mm. And this is the healing of trauma. You, you see cultures with heavy trauma. They tell good jokes. Huh. <laughs> you know? Yes. yes. So it, it wasn't, there are so many things I've learned recently about processing, about medicines, about embodiment about the heart has felt everywhere in the body but at the end of the day oh my god the fact that I laughed nonstop for an hour mm. redemption yes oh my goodness I <laughs> I feel that deeply this it's like this sense of the absurdity of it all <laughs> that, that somehow we are here at this time in this place and mm -hmm. you know I have 
I have found a tremendous amount of healing in being able to make jokes about my, um, my oldest daughter's death. <laughs> so oh. I, and I don't say this very, yeah. I don't say this lightly because there yeah. are many people that that is not somewhere that they can go with that. But of I have course. found a tremendous amount of mm-hmm. just joy. And some of that mm-hmm. is, is a result of just how Annie lived her life. Um, she, mm. she was really oblivious to like any social norms, you know, she had special needs and she was pull, would pull things off of people's plates at restaurants. And she would Love giggle, it. giggle her way through times when you're not supposed to laugh. And, <laughs> and she taught me so much about what, it, what, what it is to just the absurdity of being a human and that we have all of these, like, mm-hmm. you know, like we have, we have all these like bodily functions that are just like hilarious and funny and also yep somehow taboo and and Annie taught me that really really nothing about being human is taboo nothing about it all of it is about is connection and there's this great children's book that's called everybody poops you know and it's I, like when you're teaching your children how to be potty trained and it's this like <laughs> hey guess what even the even the most <laughs> buttoned up politically advanced you know the smartest people everybody poops and it's it is just this delight in our delight in our very absurd humanness and what a fantastic way for us to to go into the world with this curiosity and shared understanding that we're all in this together and that there is always opportunity for reconciliation there is always opportunity to come shoulder to shoulder with someone else and feel the pressure and presence of Mm. another human also going through their own hard things. Own suffering. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I j- just for you and for your listeners, I am enthralled by the Swedish filmmaker, Roy Anderson. He's mm. 80 years old. His film, You the Living, and uh, a, a pigeon sat on a line contemplating existence. I think I just got that wrong, but it's, it's about a pigeon and on and, and, and contemplating existence. And, um, endlessness endlessness it's a trilogy about being human and it's just the right down to the most basic spare scenes about just these human confessions i highly recommend you the living and these two other films pairing it right down (laughs) and it's the absurd humor Mm. of uh tragedy at Mm. times right Mm. and the joy not joy is always commingled with it and the joy Always. is commingled and at the same time, you know, really holding in our hearts, people that are living tragedies in the world right mm-hmm. now, like just, just always want to take a moment of silence just for people that have lost children, homes, lives, countries, territories, mm-hmm. you know, always. Yeah. Yeah. Especially at this time mm-hmm. of the year. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you, Rita, very, very much for mm. our long and beautiful conversation oh, and connection here. Thank you. What, what is an absolute mutual, delight. mutual <laughs> delight. Thank you. I feel uplifted and and from this connection. Thank, thank you. you. And for my listeners, before we go, P.S. <laughs>